And as we ended chapter 8 last week, Noah and his sons, his three daughter-in-laws and his wife, have uh, stepped off the ark and they have made a great offering to the Lord of one pair of all the clean animals. One pair out of the seven of all the clean animals have been offered to the Lord as a burnt offering. Well, uh, one of the things that we talked about last week was that they were on, I made mention, that they were on the ark for 365 days. Now, I left that undone because we didn't have quite the time to cover it, so I want to cover it today. How do we know and how do we get the 365 days? I want to remind you and go in your second paragraph on your front page there. It says, the scripture says that the rain began in the 600th year of Noah's life in the second month on the 17th day of the month. On the same day, all the fountains of the great deep burst open and the floodgates of the skies were open. So therefore, if we chart this out, we see that on uh, the day that the Lord shut the door of the ark and the rain began to flow and the floods began to happen, Noah is 600 years old, two months and 17 days. All, if you remember, I told you last week, all of the counting of the months, seven months past, ten months past, etc., are all in reference to the age of Noah on the day the rain began. So the rain begins. How old is Noah? He's 600 years old, two months, 17 days. By the way, uh, beginning the chapter before, if you remember, uh, Noah was 120 years younger than that. He was 480 years. And so here we've sped up time. We've gotten down here. We're down to this is how old Noah is. Now reading on it says, Now it came about in the 600th and the first year and the first month. So that's a 600 uh, uh, first year, which means 601 years. Noah is 601 years old, one month and one day. The water was dried from the earth. It tells us that. It doesn't tell anything else about it, but that's to tell us when the earth was actually dried. But the Lord has not said, time to get off the ark. In the next passage there, it says, In the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth was dry. Then God spoke to Noah, saying, Go out of the ark. So, Noah is told on, when he is 601 years old, two months and 27 days, Time to leave the ark. The door is open. They go out. They do the offering. Okay. It's the second month. It's the 27th day. He went in a, what we would call a year before, the second month, the 17th day. <clears throat> How do we get 365 out of that? Remember, the only way they knew when the month changed was because of the new moon. A, a lunar year was 12 29 and a half day, days in a month. 12 months, 29 and a half days. Now that's going to play out even today on today's Hebrew calendar. The first month of the year is 30 days. The second month is 29. The, first, the third is uh, uh, every odd year, every odd month is 30 days. Every even month is 29 days on the Hebrew calendar today. That evens out that 29 and a half days. And when the new moon comes up, as we see through the rest of the scripture, they're looking for the new moon to come up to give a special offering on the day the new moon comes up. Okay, so from, from the 600th year to the 601st year, the second month, second month, that is 12 lunar months, 300 and 54 days. That's all it is, 354. It is 11 days short of the solar year. But remember, here they do not leave the ark until day 27, not 17. So you add 11 days and we have 365 days that they are on the ark. They had no way of knowing how many months had passed without the moon coming up to the new moon. It is the only way they knew. And so that is the, I, I call it the time clock on the earth. How did the Jews know whenever it's time to do the new moon offering? The new moon offering was done whenever they looked at the sky intently because they could see it coming by the different crests of the moon. And when the new moon occurred, 
Then they came the next day for a special offering. So all of the, in all the way through, even in the book of Acts, we're dealing with a lunar year of 354 days instead of a solar year of 365 days. So that's how we get 365 days that they were on the ark. It was a full solar year. In other words, the earth had circled the sun exactly and came back to the exact same place. It doesn't make the months work right because of the extra 11 days, but it makes the earth come in one place. Now it says in Genesis chapter 9, verse 1, here is a old command that the Lord has said many times, and it's not going to change. It says, and God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Well, he said that to Adam uh, on the sixth day of creation. He said that to the animals. He said that to the trees. He said, that, fruitful and multiply. And now coming off the ark, the same instruction comes again. Fill the earth with offspring. All those birds and all those animals and all those clean animals and all those uh, unclean animals and, and humankind uh, from the three boys and their three wives are to fill the earth with offspring. Verse 2. And the fear of you and terror of you shall be on every beast of the earth and on every bird of the sky. With everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea, in your hands they are given. Now man was told at the very beginning with Adam that he was going to have dominion over everything. But now he is going to have a control over them that is part of their innate being as an animal. The word fear and the word terror. Uh, the Hebrew words are um, um, uh, mora and the word chath. Mora means an emotional fear, a frightfulness. All of the animals, not just the land animals, but also the fish and everything in the sea, are going to have a fright of man. Now that's interesting, because I don't know if you've ever noticed or not, but most animals in a forest get along together pretty well, unless they're uh, the meat eaters, who eat when they're hungry and that, and the animals have learned to, um, that are not, have learned to uh, be fearful of those animals somewhat. But for the most part, animals like animals. I am always amazed at the dog park that is over on Bay Area when 400 people show up with their dogs and they let them go and the dogs run and play like they've known each other f since the beginning of time. It's just the way they are. Uh, you can add in cows and other animals like that, and, and they, they, they're just they're comfortable together. But you let a human walk into that that they don't know, and what do you get? <laughs> because they have a natural mora, a natural fear. The word chaff is an interesting word. It's because it's that terror. It's because the animal will also have innate in him that they will have to submit to the presumed power of the humans. It's presumed. Uh, I will tell you this. There are not many animals that we are truly stronger and more powerful than. Um, many, many years ago, I had a chihuahua that was accidentally run over his uh, hind area by a car that he was chasing. And I went out to pick up that chihuahua, and let me tell you who was in control. It wasn't me. As that chihuahua began to bite me on the face and bite me down the arms and push me away, that chihuahua was stronger than I was as a 12-year-old kid. Yet I was a big guy at 12 years old, almost the size I am now. And yet that chihuahua was in charge. But the animals, even the chihuahuas and everything, even though they have the ability to do much damage to us, uh, many of those animals do not realize they have that ability. In fact, they have a fear. Animals will either run from you or will attack you. If you go out into a new uh, field and you see some deer, 
and you make some noise, what do the deer do? They run away from you because of their fear, their mora, and their chaff, which is their presumed power that you have. They're afraid of you. Now, it's interesting because we have, uh, my brother-in-law has a piece of property where he puts up those night lights, those green lights where they can watch what's happening. And, uh, and so the night lights are out because he's having a problem. And lo and behold, he thinks he's got a hog problem. Well, lo and behold, he hasn't got a hog problem. The hogs are the least of his problem. He's got raccoon problems. Uh, plus hogs. Plus coyotes. Plus everything else. And lo and behold, he came and said, I want to show you what showed up. I put this camera out last night. And Jim, I want to show you what came up. And there's like 15 different types of animals that just kind of show up in that light at the feeder to eat. It's feeding time. Coming to eat, want to know who, what was getting what. And they just all kind of did their thing and they were not afraid of each other. But I guarantee you, if my brother Kenny, my brother-in-law Kenny, had showed up, you know what happened to all those animals? They run away because of the natural instinct that the Lord is putting in them of the mora and also of the chaff. Now, let's say that a lion was involved with this too. It's kind of interesting because lions, too, in the wild will go up and just kind of be around in the same neighborhood of all these other animals. While these other animals will run from you, what will a lion do? A lion will come towards you. Why? Because of the same two reasons. Because of the fear and the terror, the more on the chaff, the presumed. They will attack you. They attack because of the same two issues that are within them that the animals that run away from. So whether they're running away from you or whether they're attacking you to protect their, their, their cubs and whatever that's around, and they'll give their life for their cubs. You realize that. They'll give their life. I tell you what, a mama bear, you get between uh, some baby bears and, and the mama, and the mama will attack you because she is fearful of you. She has a terror about you. You put those animals into captivity, and lo and behold, they are, in many cases, still very wild, and they're still trying to attack, but they are subdued because of the presumed power that you have. All animals. Go to our water worlds that have had the largest animals in the world in the water, and our humans are out playing with them and controlling them they don't have to do that. In fact, many times it doesn't work out well. We've seen that for some of our trainers have accidentally been killed because of them. Because the well is doing what the well does naturally, but not doing it in a, because they are uh, uh, trying to hurt the person, but because it's what they're, many, many times it's they're trying to protect them as they would their own small little offspring where they would grab their offspring and nudge them and take them to the bottom to protect them. And so we, that's what the, the trainers are telling us. So they're doing what they're doing, even to protect the ones that they presume to have power over them. But listen, I'm telling you, there's not one of us that a small alligator can't control. There's not one of us that a snake cannot control. There's not one of us that a small dog cannot control. Oh, yeah, we have power with our guns and with our chains, and, and, and we can pick up a billy club or whatever and try to protect ourselves. But guess what? With a billy club, you're probably going to end up with a bite or two. It's just the way it is. Just the way it is. I remember one day a Doverman Pincher came running at me. I had to decide. I was at the back of my car. I had the trunk open. I had to decide, am I going to get in the trunk or am I going to get on the car? And I grabbed a two-by-four and shut the lid of the car and got on the car. And I realized I had made the wrong choice because... From the trunk of the car, I could have pushed the back seat out. This always bothers me because people who get locked in the back seat of the car don't realize all you got to do is turn around and push the back seat out. You just pop it out. It'll pop right out. Just back up and just kick it out, and you're in the car. No, I chose to go up on the car. Guess where the Doverman chose to come? I took the old uh, two before and hit the Doverman right across his nose. Doverman sat down, and guess what happened after that? I just made him mad just made I had to climb up on the top of the car and only because the car was slick and had a had a little edge to it on the back was that Doverman not able to get to me until its master came out and blew this thing that I couldn't hear and the Doverman went off who's the Doverman 
uh, what's the Doverman doing? The Doverman is coming after me in fear and terror, but the master comes out and blows the whistle you cannot hear, and the Doverman goes around, sits right beside him in submission. Animals after the flood have this fear and terror of the presumed power of humans, is what the Lord is saying here. They're all given into the hands of man to be used. Now let's see about our food supply. Verse 3. Every moving thing that is alive shall be food for you. I give all to you as I gave the green plant. Time out. Prior to the flood because of this voice, verse, it is safe for us to pretty much assume that man was pretty much a vegetarian prior to the flood. Because the instruction was previously that they were able to eat of any tree that out there that had a couple of prohibitions. They had to produce a certain size kind of berry. They had to produce certain types of fruit, whatever. Go back to our lesson. We did that <coughs> several lessons ago that tells us what the ha those prohibitions are. And now they can eat from everything that um, is for food for them. He goes on, only you shall not eat the flesh with its life. So we've got true, two prohibitions now in this instruction. You cannot eat the flesh with its life. And he goes on to say, that is its blood. So humans could eat animal meat as long as they did not pull, catch the blood and eat the blood. They must let the blood drain from the body or be cooked out of the body before they could eat of the, of the meat. Eat the, eat the meat. Verse 5 picks up another topic. He says, And surely I will require your lifeblood. From every beast I will require it, and from every man, from every man's brother, I will require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed, for in the image of God he made man. Prohibition 2. You can eat the food of anyone, any animal out there, but you may not kill a human for food. If you kill a human for food, intentionally kill the human for food, the penalty for killing a human for food is your own life. Now remember I've told you that in the first 11 chapters, now we're only in chapter 9 here, but in first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis, the the seeds of all of theology that is going to be spun out and fully developed through the book of Revelation is all in the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis. We've already seen about sin. We've already seen about salvation. We've already seen about the life prior to the flood and the life after the flood with the saving action of the Lord in between to save Noah. The same thing happens to us. It will be developed on as we go on through. The same thing happens as how the, we have an old life, a carnal life on this earth. And we accept the Lord as our Savior and we enter into a new life. Every time you see me baptized, you hear me say you're buried with death into the light. You're buried with Christ into the likeness of his death. That old life is put away. And you are raised to walk in what? A newness of life. And I always add this, to serve your Lord forevermore. That's the picture of going past the flood for Noah and his sons. That was the picture that set up the kernel, the seed that's planted, so that as the theme develops here, we see two things develop, developing. Number one, we see that the seed of the death penalty is put in place. The death penalty. Now, here we are talking about killing animals intentionally for food. We are talking about, then he turns to talk about do not eat humans. In other words, cannibalism. Do not participate in cannibalism. That's the first thing. Second thing is this. Do not kill a human intentionally. Now, and if you do, the penalty for that is your death, earthly death. They're going to take your life for that. Now that's going to be developed on through the rest of Scripture in some other places. But we have to ask the question. Does the killing of another, another human being extend to wars and protection of your family against evil people? 
And the answer is no. In fact, the next chapter and the next lesson is chapter 11, and then we hit chapter 12 with Abram. And by the time we get to chapter 14, Abram, who we think about being the father of the Jewish faith, the Hebrew faith, is going to take his 3,300 fighting men that are part of his family, and they're going to war, and they're killing folks. And so we're going to see the development of this death penalty for killing someone intentionally to in war, and we're trying to defend your family, and you're trying to defeat evil that is against your family and against your community. We're going to see that. The Lord puts that in a different category as we pass on down through these chapters. We'll see that develop. Verse, verse 7 says this, a great covenant. Yes, sir. In the Ten Commandments, you do not intentionally kill to kill someone. That's right. Either for food or anything else. Not talking about in war. We're talking about tribal. Now, now remember, the Ten Commandments were given to the Jews to begin with. To live with inside the wilderness. And then in their life when they go into the promised land. They are not to kill each other intentionally. In fact, probably the worst, the worst um, episode in the... the um, Israeli life is when the Benjamite tribe of the 12 tribes in the book of Judges, chapter 22, this is not in your notes, so it's free, uh, decides that they like the women of some, um, and they need some wives for some husbands, and they go about doing uh, something that is uh, very sinful in what they're doing. And the 11 other brother tribes try to go and straighten out Benjamin, and it's not, they're not able to do it, and ben, they have a fight. And 20, the 11 tribes lose 20, I'm doing this by memory, 22,000, I believe, uh, sons as they try to straighten out the Benjamites. And they go home, and they are so mournful over the uh, tragedy that's happened, the loss of so many of their, of their kin, their, their young men. They've tried to fight to straighten out the Benjamites. The, that's the 12th tribe. That's the, that's the heirs. I mean, that's descendants. They're relatives. That they can't even eat. They cannot even eat. And they go back into battle without sustenance. And they lose again. They lose again to the Benjamites. It's only on the third time that they actually are able to put them in check and bring them back in the fold uh, with the right understanding. It's a terrible deal. And they're killing each other, but they're not supposed to, no. But they're doing it because of the evil that the Benjamites are doing. And so there, there's an understanding of that. Verse 7, And as for you, be fruitful and multiply. Populate the earth abundantly and multiply in it. Uh, go out there. Listen, we have to understand this is being told to Noah, the three sons, the three uh, wives of the sons, and to Noah's wife. Eight people are hearing this. Be fruitful and multiply. Now, I don't know about you. If I'm getting off of a, if I'm getting off of a, a barge, a covered barge, way up in the mountains of Ararat, see that mountain range up there in Ararat on our, on our picture up there, and we're going to come down and find some water, and we're going to make an offering and we're going to come on down, and the Lord is saying, be fruitful and multiply. I'm not sure that life looks very exciting. I mean, what are we going to do? We're going to struggle to survive. That's what they're going to do. But God looked at them and spoke to Noah and his sons with him, saying, Behold, now I, now I myself do establish my covenant with you. God's doing it. Noah has nothing to do with it. Shem, Japheth, and, and Ham have nothing to do with it. It's God's doing. God makes the covenant with you and your descendants hereafter. And every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, the beast, the earth with you, and all of all that comes out of the ark, even every beast of the earth. I'm making this covenant with all the animals. What's the covenant? 
I establish my covenant with you and all the flesh shall never again be cut off from the water of the flood. Neither shall there again be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I am making between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all successive generations. I set my bow in the cloud and it shall be a sign of a covenant between me and the earth. In other words, the earth the creeping things, the crawling things, the beasts, the cattle, and the humans. And it shall come about that when I bring a cloud over the earth, that the bow shall be seen in the cloud, and I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. <clears throat> and never again shall the water become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the cloud... <clears throat> then I will look upon it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, <clears throat> This is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all the flesh that is on the earth. I mean, he's, he said it over and over and over again. He doesn't want Noah to miss the fact. Have you ever noticed <clears throat> that a rainbow, a rainbow only appears on a rainy day when the sun is also shining through. And it always <coughs> occurs <coughs> on the opposite side from which the sun is shining. And the rainbow always has within it all the colors of the prism. I didn't put it in your lesson, but I know about it, but I don't understand it. But, but the circumstances are this. Usually when there's one, there's a second rainbow. It's a lighter rainbow somewhere on down the line. And I don't understand how that is, so I did not talk about it in the lesson, but I just think it's a miracle. It's just an, an incredible thing uh, that is, is happening. Verse 18. Now the sun's... Now, you know, I want to ask one more question. I wonder if when the rainbow is in the sky, just me, just me thinking, do the animals see the rainbow? Do the animals... Know what the rainbow's for. Because he makes it pretty clear it's between God and humans and God and the animals. Do the animals see it? Do they know what's going on? Do they what? Do they see color? I, I, I don't know. No animal has ever told me that they see color or not. <laughs> and, and if you have one that has, unless it's Balaam's donkey, we may be having a little bit of trouble here. And you said that right. If it's for them, they should see it. And I want to tell you, I think they do. Because have you ever noticed that when the rainbow comes out, the animals come out and start tweeting and the birds start singing and all of that. So I think they do. They know. Well, it's very interesting, too, that how when the storms are coming, we're still trying to get our hamburgers made on the grill and all the animals are already headed for the, for the, for the shelter. Uh, and there's not a cloud in the sky yet. And they're headed for shelter. Tom, yes. I have seen a, a triple rainbow. You have seen a triple rainbow. Is that because you have trifocals? <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Verse 18. Now the sons of Noah who came out of the ark were Ham, Sham, and Japheth. So the Lord's just making sure we remember who we're talking about here. And Ham was the father of Canaan. Where did he come from? Why Canaan? These are the three sons of Noah. From the, uh, these, the whole earth was populated. Canaan. Okay, now wait a minute. Wait a minute. Canaan. All right, it just so happens that I have read the rest of the chapter and charted it out for you. You have it in your handouts, but we also have it up on the board. Canaan is right there, and he's not even the first child of Ham. The first child of Ham is Cush, and then uh, Mizram, and then Canaan, okay, of Ham. Well, let me tell you what's happening in this chapter. This chapter and the next chapter. There's some important things that are going to be said to lay some theological seeds. God is in the midst of this chapter. He's laying theological seeds. He's going to lay out for us Everyone who is part of the picture that's going to take us down to Abram by the time we get through with chapter 11 next week. We're going to end with chapter 10 this week. Chapter 11 is going to get us down to Abram. 
He's laying out all the players and how many people are there. And there are two specific stories he's going to put in, into this. Actually, three he's going to put into this genealogy. But now he brings up Canaan. Canaan's not even born yet. Canaan's not born yet. And here's what happens. See if we can understand, explain it. Canaan's mentioned because Canaan's part of the story that's coming up. Only because he's part of the story. Then Noah began farming and planted a vineyard. And he drank of the wine and became drunk. And uncovered himself inside his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, actually it is the father of Canaan, but Canaan's not around yet, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. And Sham and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon their shoulders and walked backwards and covered the nakedness of their father and their faces were turned away so that they did not see their father's nakedness. Now let's just explain. There's lots of supposition about what happened in this and that's all it is is supposition. We do not know anything more than this. Noah got off the ark. He made the offering. They went about farming to raise crops. He planted a vineyard. He gathered the grapes. He made wine. He drank some of the wine that was a little older than some of the new wine. Because new wine is nothing but grape juice. Old wine has got a punch to it. And it isn't like Sprite and, and orange sherbet either, okay, or lime sherbet. It's a punch. And lo and behold, before he knew it, Noah was drunk. And in his drunken stupor, inside his own tent, inside his own house, behold, he took his clothes off and he was naked. In his own tent. Well, have you ever been naked in your house? I'm not going to ask you if you've ever been drunk in your house naked. I'm just asking, okay? Just, we'll leave that one where it is. And Ham comes to the tent, and he sees his father inside the tent, laid out there in a drunken stupor. I like the word stupor. And he is naked. And he goes to his brothers, Japheth and Shem, and he nagads them. N-A-G-A-D. Nagad. So we got some Hebrew words that don't get translated really well. I think y'all have found that out so far. Not translated really well. Nagad means to go and complain or to confront someone about something that is visually obvious to everyone. Shem. Japheth, dad's drunk and asleep and naked in the tent. He's passed out. So Shem and Japheth take a cover, put it on their shoulders, walk backwards, and lay it across their father. Two things are here. The seeds of two theological thoughts. God is in the midst of these because two theological thoughts that are very important that are going to come out. One is, honor thy father so the days of your life shall be long. It's one of the Ten Commandments. Honor your father. Shem comes out, he complains. Japheth and Shem, I'm sorry, Ham comes out and he complains to his brothers. And Japheth and Shem do not want to do anything that brings dishonor to their father. Because remember this. By honoring your father and your mother, Exodus 20, so it's your days to be long upon this life, which is part of the Ten Commandments, means that you are not going to do anything that brings dishonor to your parents. That is for you, not for your parents. Now let me tell you a little secret. Not everybody has good, honorable parents. Not everybody has parents that you want to do something to bring honor to them. 
Some of you may have had in your life drunken, sinful parents. And in fact, for those that I have met that have had drunken, sinful parents, those parents have dug a hole for the family that it's almost, almost impossible for those children to dig out of. But as children, whether our parents are worthy of us bringing them honor or not, the commandment is, in the seat of thought here, to bring them honor. You do not want to be the child that all the people in the town says, You see that child? Well, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. He's just like his worthless dad. Or he's just like his, or she's just like her sinful mom. No. The Lord, Lord wants us to be a person that rises up and becomes someone that brings honor even to those parents who are disgraceful. Well, you can tell that child didn't fall from the tree. That child's made something out of themselves. They didn't follow in the same line that the parents did. The sad part about it is, a parent has three children. Lo and behold, one of those children is going to end up just like the parents. One of them is probably going to be different. One of them is going to be a messy hoarder like mom. The other one, you can eat off of their floors when they're an adult. And the middle one, you never know which way they're going to fly. One way or the other. Sometimes they're on this side. Sometimes it's on this side. There's a third one always. I will tell you this. I've seen it too many times. When a parent has died, we've done the will. All the kids get the same amount of money. Within 30 days, one of them doesn't have it. Within 90 days, another one doesn't have it. And 100 years from now, the other one has every penny of it. It's just the way it works. Just the way it works. First of all, Sham and Japheth bring honor to their father. By number two seed of thought, they do not look upon his, his nakedness. In other words, the understanding of family ethics is already in place with Noah and his family when this occurs. It's going to take us getting to Leviticus chapter 18... That the Lord is going to give specific instructions of whom a person can look upon their nakedness. Now husband and wives, you can look upon the nakedness of your spouse all day long. Have a good time looking at the nakedness of your spouse all day long. In fact, some of us need to look at our spouse more than just all day long naked. We need to spend time together. It's kind of interesting because it's kind of hard to argue when you're naked, by the way. <laughs> it's just one of those things. It's, I'm just, just saying, okay. Husband and wives can be naked in front of each other, and that is a beautiful thing. It is purity. It is holy. It's what's supposed to happen. But a child is not supposed to look upon the nakedness of their father or upon the nakedness of their mother. Or upon the nakedness of their brother or their sister. Or upon the nakedness of their cousins or their aunts or their uncles or any of that. And the aunts and the uncles are not supposed to look upon the nakedness of someone else's children. And the list goes on and on and on when we get to Leviticus. There's a family ethics that's involved. And here is the seed of the kernel of that truth that's going to be developed on through the scripture. Now, all over our television today. All over our television today. We have... Those who are trying to tell us that Christians have made a terrible doctrine about the body and nakedness. And yet all we're doing is following the Lord's instruction. That we have made it ugly to be out on the beach with 300 other people naked. That we've made that to be ugly. No, the seeds of the thoughts are right here. It's going on. And Noah awoke from his wine. It wore off. 
He knew that his youngest son, he knew what his youngest son had done to him. So he said, "Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants. He shall be to his brothers." Wait a minute, Canaan's not even born yet, and Noah is cursing an unborn child when he should be cursing the father. Correct? Okay. By the way, the word Canaan means low. Low. Why is he doing this? Why is he doing this? Well, not exactly. The Lord already knows what's going to happen. And after we get past Genesis 11, which is next week, uh, the details of what's being told to us in Genesis chapter 10, the next chapter we're going to be in, uh, lays out for us an understanding that Canaan, after the Tower of Babel, when the Tower of Babel occurs, Canaan is going to land over in what we call the land of Canaan, the promised land. And that his descendants are going to be the most sinful people that we could know on earth. They are terrible. And in fact, in fact, the livelihood of the Canaanites is the example of what the Lord is going to use to those who are the children of Israel as the opposite of what they are supposed to, Israelites are supposed to be to be holy. The Canaanites are cutting the sides of their hair into mohawks. They're cutting the edges of their beard to show a goatee. And the Lord says to the Children of Israel, do not cut the sides of your head for a mohawk. Do not cut the sides of your beard to form a goatee. He is saying when you're dwelling in that land, look different than them. Act different than them. Be different than them. The Canaanites are tattooing themselves. They're cutting their marks on them. And the scripture in Leviticus says to the Israelites, do not make cuts on your body. For religious purposes in, in religious rituals. Do not tattoo yourself. In other words, the Lord is setting up. The Canaanites wore short, really skirt-like dresses. They didn't wear the long robes like the biblical characters of the Israelites did. Why? Because the Israelites were to stick out like a sore thumb. When the Israelites went from one country to another... Everyone knew who they were because of the way they dressed, the way they wore their hair, the way they wore their beard, the way they walked, the way their sandals were made, the way they smelled, what they ate. They were to be different than the rest of the world. Now that theology, that seed of truth is going to spin out through also because you and I are to look different than the rest of the world. We are to walk different than the rest of the world. We are to be different than the rest of the world. My time is running out, so I need to hurry up because we've got a little ways to go here. Verse 26 says this, And he also said, The completion of this thing to Canaan. I, I can't pass this up. i got to back up. How was Canaan to serve his brothers? Let me just tell you how this. How was Canaan to serve Shem and to serve Japheth? How was that to happen? How, how, are we talking about uh, they're supposed to be in slavery or whatever? No, we're not talking about that. We're not talking about slavery in any other way. And here's the reason why. Canaan may have been dark-skinned, but he wasn't as dark-skinned as his brother Cush because the name Cush means black. Canaan just means low. And the Canaanites were closer to the same color as the Israelites. So it was kind of hard to tell. The only thing that you could tell difference was, was the, way they, the way they dressed, the way they walked, the, what they did, what they talked, where, the way they didn't do tattoos. They had to look different, significantly different. What did the Canaanites do? The Lord, it's interesting. Let me go on, verse 26. So he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let the Canaanite, Canaan be his servant. And may God enlarge Jephthah and let him dwell in the tents of Shem and let Cana be his servant. So Cana is going to serve Shem and Cana is also going to serve Jephthah. How is Cana going to serve Je Shem? We're not talking about slavery here as some would like to teach and I was taught growing up. That's not what we're talking about here. How did Canaan serve Shem? Well, when it came time to build the temple, Canaan's descendants, Sidon and some of the other, Sidonites and some of the other tribes, 
cut the timbers of Lebanon and brought them down for the temple. The Canaanites and their descendants uh, cut the stone in the quarry and brought them to the temple. The Canaanites erected the temple for the Shemites, for the Jews. Later on, if the temple's destroyed and they come back from exile, who builds the temple? It's the Canaanites who are building the temple. They're the ones putting it back together for the Jews. Uh, Abram, Abram is going to have power and dominion over these Canaanites also. Going to have to live with them. Because um, when they steal Lot, uh, when they steal Lot and take him away, Abram has to pick up his 300 fighting men and go fight war and kill some of them so they can bring Lot back to the city where they will belong. I can go on down, on and on and on on these situations. Now let me tell you what the big one is. When Jesus couldn't make it to Calvary with carrying His cross, the Roman soldier reached over and pulled a Canaanite into service to carry the cross of the Lord onto Calvary. I can show you hundreds of these examples, and they're not, we're, talking, we're not talking about slavery or enslaving the people. We're talking about they help in the service. Now with this passage, we see something interesting. The God of Shem let Canaan serve him, and he does. I've already given you those examples. But then it says, May God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem. Why is Shem giving up his tents to Japheth? It's a prophecy. It's a seed. It's a theological seed that's planted. Because the Savior is going to come of the world, and my Savior and your Savior is going to come from Shem. And then Shem is going to reject him and leave the tents. And who comes in to fill the tents? The Gentiles, the Japheths, come in to take the Savior, to dwell in the tents of Shem. And Canaan serves them also. Verse 28, And Noah lived 350 years after the flood, so all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. Thank you, Lord. Noah has died. We are not done with Noah, but almost. And you're going to see something interesting next week. Now, we've only got a few minutes, but I want to go through this very quickly. It says, Now, these are the generation of the records of the generations of Ham, Sham, and Japheth, the sons of Noah, the ones that were born to them after the flood. And you'll see in verse 2, it says the sons of Japheth were Gomar, Magog. Okay, listen, I've, I've got this out here on the board for us, okay? It, it all comes down to just charts, and that's what I've done for just charts, okay? Uh, so that we can speed through this, because I do not want you this to be the most boring lesson that you've ever had in your life. I handed this lesson to the editor on Wednesday night. I said, this is probably the most boring lesson that you're ever going to edit for me. And when she came in on Friday, I said, was this the most boring lesson that you have ever edited for, for me? And she said, no, but it is in the top two. And so uh, this genealogy stuff can be boring. I don't want it to be boring. I want to make it alive. And she says, I'm sure you'll make it alive. I'm going to make it alive because we're going to hit the highlights, okay? In fact, we're, I'm, I'm not going to read the scripture except for a few places I want to draw your attention to. Sham has, has four sons, Gomer, Magog, Medea, and Javan. Javan, by the way, is, is, is they're going to land in Greece. Uh, Gomer's going to be up towards the Russians. Uh, Magog, you know Magog because we hear his name over in the book of Revelation. Yes, that's the descendants of Magog. Shem's going to have Elam, Asher, Akpachshad, Lud, and Aram. Uh, these are going to be the Shemites. Uh, we're going to have the Hamites, Cush, Marism, and uh, Canaan. Cush is going to land in um, southern part, well, yeah, the southern part of um, below Egypt. Uh, Mizram is going to become Egypt. And Canaan is going to land over in what we call the promised land. Cush is also going to land over in India. All right? So if you see on your map, let me see if I can pull that map up. There's the map that you have. If you can see it, it says Japheth right in the middle. That's the descendants of Japheth all the way down for three generations. And the way when you're looking at your map... If the letter is in, letters are all in caps, here's the kind of the legend that I did for the map. If they're in caps like this, that's the name of the, of the son of, of Noah. Uh, when you get down to, and it's the capital letter, and the letters are blocky, those are the um, grandsons of Noah. That's the second generation from 
Ham, Sheba, Japheth. And then if it's just in regular text, that is the third generation. And in one case, in the Shemites, I actually do a fourth generation. It's the name Eber, because Eber is where we get the word Hebrew from, okay? The descendants of Eber, this descendants right here, who goes on down through Peg, Legend, and Jochen, that is where we get uh, the name Hebrews from. And everybody after that's going to be called Hebrews because of Eber. Now, we, we look at all these, and, these all, and all these names have many. Here's Tarshish. There's Tarshish right there. He's the son of Javan. He, he's, he's part of the people that are going to become the Greeks, and they're going to move on over, and the Tarshish is on in Spain, okay? That's where, um, that's where Jonah is going to try to run to whenever when he hops on the boat. He's headed to Tarshish. He's headed to the hometown that this guy right here has established in all his people. Well, there's a couple of things I want to see. I want you to see. I've given you most of the names, the meanings of the names. The meanings are important because later on, as the story goes on, we're going to refer back because the names of these folks tell us a story. So let's skip on in this because these are just charts laying out. I want you to go to Genesis chapter 10, verse 8. Genesis chapter 10, verse 7, it says, Cush. He says, now Cush became the father of Nimrod. Right here. He was the mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erech, Akkad, as, as, as in the word Akkadian, and Calni in the land of Shinar. Let me pull that map up for you, too. Um, there are the Hamites, and there are the Shemites right there. See, they're right there in the middle of that map. I have the word Babel. They have come off the ark, and they have stayed together. And they are not supposed to stay together. They are supposed to populate the entire world. But they've stayed together. And on the way down, they have created the town of... Um, i find you a different map for that. They have created the town of Nineveh, Kala, Akkad, and now Babel. Erect is going to be uh, formed afterwards, and there's another one there that we don't know, uh, another town there that we don't exactly know where it is. And the people are staying together. <clears throat> now, the text in chapter 10 tells us that these are great cities. They are all going to be great cities, but the whole crowd of them moved to Babel. The whole crowd moved to Babel. And so they have started a village in each of these places, but they've abandoned it. And after the Tower of Babel, some of the people are going to move back into those villages and make them great cities. So from that, they're going to be at the town of Babel. Now Babel is going to be important because Nimrod is the guy that's going to pull everybody together and say, let's build a city and a tower. Let's take mud and let's burn it in the furnace and let's make it harden into bricks and let's build a tower that reaches into the heavens. That's the beginning of Genesis chapter 11, next week's lesson. Going on, I want you to see something else. I want you to see in, let's see here, where is it? It is in Genesis chapter 10, Genesis chapter 10, verse 23. It says a ram starting. Next major point, important point. It says in the sons of Aram, now Aram is Syria, okay? That's Syria. We still deal with Syria today. All right. When we're dealing with all the stuff that's going on with ISIS and they're in Syria, that is the sons of Aram. That's the children of Aram. They were Uz and Hull. Uz and Hull are going to be important to us when we get to Abraham. They're also important to us because of a man by the name of Job. Takes his lineage back to here. Gethar and Mash. And Akpakshed became the father of Shelah. And Shelah became the father of Eber. That's where I'm talking about. Eber is where we get the word Hebrew from. Put an H in front of it. And the two sons born to Eber, the name of one was Peleg. For in his days the earth was divided and his brother was Joktan. Okay? If you look at those charts that I have there, they have little numbers beside them. Noah's number one. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, twenty-four. All the way down. To Peleg, 45. 45.
Joktan is 46, because Joktan is the younger brother of Peleg. The Tower of Babel occurs either in the birth year of Peleg or at least during the life of Peleg. The Tower of Babel. Why? Because the scripture says here, in the life of Peleg, the earth was divided. It was divided among because they had stuck together. So that means we have 46 men who have families that are alive at the Tower of Babel that are building a tower. Huh. 46. How many family units are going to be divided into languages? How many languages are going to go out from there? Pretty interesting. In fact, the thing closes, chapter 10 closes by saying, These are the sons of Sham according to their fathers, according to their languages, by their lands, according to their nations. These are the families of the sons of Noah according to their genealogies, by their nations. And out of these the nations were separated on the earth after the flood. How long after the flood? Well, I'm going to tell you something. You don't want to miss next week's lesson. And here's the reason why. Number one, one of these men that wrote on this ark is going to live an extremely long time after he comes off the ark. Extremely long. And it's going to be a surprise to you who all came and went during the life of one of these men off this ark. Number two. The text in chapter 11 is going to tell us exactly the year that Peleg was born. Which tells us how long Peleg was alive and it gives us a parameter of when the Tower of Babel could happen. Okay? Very interesting. And there's some more good stuff too. But I haven't got time to tease you with it right now. That lesson is done and I'm ready to do it. I wish I had time, but we just don't. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this time just to look in your word and study your word. We're thankful that you have given us the name of the men who were there, the names of the how old they were, the years and their life and all of that so that we would know, so the timeline can continue all the way down to our Savior so that we cannot be fooled by those who would wish to tell us that we're crazy because we believe that this Word of God is the inerrant Word from you, divinely inspired. And we're not fooled by the speculation of the scientist and the mockers of your Word. But you've detailed it out for us in your name. Thank you for that. Amen and amen.